Okay, so thank you all so much for being here. IWBC is so proud and happy to support everything that you're doing. And we just are so excited to get to know you today. So let's start off. Can you just like tell me a little bit about like who you are? What what things do you love to do? Like, why did you pick your instrument? Just tell me a little, just like a little snapshot into who you are. Let's start with Yasmeen. Awesome, awesome. Um, well, thank you for thank you for interviewing us. This is super fun, and I'm excited to to get to know everybody too. Um, so I am a French horn player. Um, I'm originally from the Los Angeles area, Bay Area. Um, I started playing French horn I think when I was like maybe 11, um, and I really wanted to play the sax, but my friend was actually playing the horn, so I was like, fine. You know, at least I know somebody on the instrument. Um, and I was not like the biggest fan of it until I got to marching band and realized that I wasn't a big fan of marching band, <laughs> like sitting down in concert venues and things like that. Um, so, so yeah, that's sort of how I started on the horn. And then I didn't really receive lessons until the summer going into my senior year of high school. And, um, I just decided to just take it seriously and, uh, and my teacher packaged me up in like nine months and I went to UCLA and then everything else has pretty much been everything else. So, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Let's stick with high brass and have Brie next. Brie, can you tell us a little bit about who you are, what you love to do, what your instrument is? Yeah, um, so it's kind of similar to Jazzy. I actually started off on saxophone in band um, as a way to spite my dad because he said girls couldn't play saxophone. So I was like, all right, bet. So I'll stay on saxophone until I get around like first chair. And then once all the boys were behind me, I was like, wait a minute, I hate the saxophone. So I dropped that shiny J thing and got a real instrument. And I was very excited to play the trumpet. <laughs> it took me a while to shave off trump uh, saxophone. Actually, it wasn't until I was in high school and they were like, yeah, we have standards and your saxophone playing is not really in those. So we prefer if you just played trumpet uh, even after marching season. And I was like, that's OK. I already learned Careless Whisper. This instrument served its purpose to me. And um, then I got into community church playing and that pushed me through to like a more professional like level of trumpet playing and now it's kind of like more of what I do now is more like church trumpet playing and a bit of orchestra stuff so that's where I'm at now. That's awesome I love that that's like Brie in a nutshell sunshiny and happy and like this <laughs> hilarious story <laughs> let's see let's do Jazzy next Jazzy can you tell us a little bit about yourself um, what you like to do what instrument you play yeah, um, I'm Jazzy. I am a tuba player um, currently in Lansing, Michigan, um, originally from Long Island, New York. Um, I chose the tuba after, well, I started on violin in the third grade because we were only given strings to start and I just wanted to play an instrument. Um, and then I was kind of miserable on that. So then we got band instruments and I really wanted to play the tuba because of Veggie Tales, like my entire life. So I chose the trombone very naturally. Um, and when I opened the case, I realized it wasn't a tuba and I was really disappointed for a whole year. And then finally, um, my band director was just like, do you want to play the tuba? And then I chose it and I've been there ever since. Awesome. I love it. Vivi, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Um, so I'm originally, uh, from California and I play the tuba. I did my undergrad at UCLA, go Bruins. <laughs> and I'm doing my master's at Yale right now. Um, and I actually hopping onto the like almost saxophone player, but not quite train. I signed up in middle school band because my mom played the saxophone and she was like, that's what you should do. And I got there and they were like, we're sorry, no more room. The only instrument left is a tuba. And I was like, okay, like I'll just get assigned. Um, but it, it turned out okay. I think like I'm still here playing tuba several decades later. Um, and yeah, so that's how that happened. <laughs> I love this. I love hearing these paths that each of you took. Veronica, do you have any interesting, crazy stories about how you got to your instrument? Can you tell us a little about yourself? Oh, there was a huge argument with me and my band director about my instrument. <laughs> but uh, let me introduce myself first. Uh, my name's Veronica uh, Taylor Christie. I am from the Central Coast in California, but I currently live in the Bay. Um, I have been navigating between the worlds of bass trombone mostly, and I also play tenor trombone. So those are my two uh, main instruments. But uh, I guess to go back to the argument story, um, 
I've been playing trombone since fourth grade. And, you know, when you first start off with instruments, you kind of want the ones that you see the most. So of course I, I wanted to play like flute or violin, but they ran out because also all the other kids wanted to play those. So I, I settled with, um, you know, the what was remaining and I, I wanted the one with the big boot or looked like a big boot. So <laughs> I, I chose that one and I just kind of stuck with it. Um, but as for kind of navigating from playing tenor trombone to bass trombone, um, I was very much so wanting to be a first trombone player uh, in jazz band because uh, you get to do a lot of like the stylistic slurs and you just feel like the top dog in charge. <laughs> and and uh, my teacher at the time, he was like, we already have a lot of first trombone stylistic players. Like we, we need a bass trombone player. And so of course I got a little like scrunched about it because it's fourth bone and fourth means not first. And so I just wanted to be the winner, even though I thought that was like being the winner, but really playing bass trombone is the winner because you get to play all the nice edgy, like hardcore lines and get to line up with whether it's a tuba or a bass player and you, you get to add the meat to the section. So um, that's, that's kind of how I kind of settled into that because I felt kind of like, you know, um, I, um, I can't curse on here. So I, I just wanted to feel like really powerful as a player. So I stuck with the bass trombone from, from high school to college to now. I love all these paths. It's so, so interesting getting to know all of you and seeing how you came to your instrument. And I think what's even more interesting is, is how you all came together into this collective, this ensemble, this virtual thing, right? That, that you haven't even all of you met in person yet, but it's so important and groundbreaking. Can you tell us a little bit about like, how did CBC start? Just talk to us. I mean, we know it because we're in it, but, but let's tell everyone else, like, what is the importance of this group? What is the significance? Why does everyone need to follow every single thing you're doing every day? The Chromatic Brass Collective, founded by Black Woman, is an organization for brass musicians that celebrates, performs, mentors, and educates in an effort to increase the visibility of racially and ethnically underrepresented women and gender non-conforming people throughout the brass world. So, so we started this group after meeting on a discussion or meeting at a discussion um, that talked about um, the struggles of being an underrepresented woman and usually in a black woman um, in classical music. And what happened was we all sort of were put into the situation where we were put together. And I think sort of the natural progression was to make a group um, that sort of addressed a lot of the concerns that we had said in the discussion, because it's one thing to talk about the issues. It's another thing to actually do something about it and build something to actually help the problem. Um, and so it sort of felt like a, a natural thing to do to create an ensemble. Um, and then we also had the added load of there not being enough brass players like us in one area. So it became a matter of let's figure out how to bring everybody together throughout the whole country. Um, and thus this sort of decentralized model that we have right now, um, because it's sort of I realize a privilege to be able to play with people like you, yourself, like in person. I didn't know that. Um, so that was one thing that we learned. And we just wanted to create something that, that would give everybody a platform to say things that they had been waiting to say and to say things like, this has made me uncomfortable or this is something that I want to change or something of that nature. And for me personally, sometimes when I was in undergrad and when I was in graduate school, I would sort of feel small to the extent that nobody would really listen to what I was saying and what I was feeling. And nobody asked me, Yasmin, how are you doing with this primarily white institution both times? And I think one thing that we really, really want to drive home is creating sort of a platform for people to not feel like it's on them specifically to say, this is a problem. This is a thing that needs to get better. It's on all of us. Um, and sort of more of a unionized kind of model. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing so many head nods and in, in an agreement and I'd love to get some more takes on, on just the importance, what this group has meant to you, what you think it's gonna do for, um, what I think we know it's going to do for future generations of musicians. Um, I, first, I want to touch on what Yasmin said about how like it just felt like the natural move for us to be a group because it was just so beautifully guided how like we were talking about the same thing, wanting to take action. And then it's just like you look around, it's like, wait a minute now, 
I think we're all kind of talented too. I don't know. I kind of get along with y'all. Maybe we should stay together or something, you know? So that was like, it was just really nice that like we all happened to be at like a good skill level and have a good energy. That way we could like keep doing this for like, it's been now almost a year since that first meeting. So that was like really nice sustainable stuff that like, I'm really, I feel very happy and fortunate that we had that start and that we're still here now. Um, but aside from that, I think it's really cool to have that union because I don't really get to, I'm in Florida. I don't really get to play with other people of color much. I'm usually the only black person in my ensembles. Like even if it's like a full orchestra, it's just me. Um, so the idea that I can at least talk to another trumpet player in the collective or like I have friends now that are like me, even if like they aren't like right next to me. And it makes me feel a lot less alone, which is very nice in the pandemic to be able to like make all these new friends that I've never gotten to make before and have this community. I really appreciate the Chromatic Brass Collective as a community and like that aspect of it too. Um, and I'm really excited for the outreach work we're doing. I'm outreach director, so I should be excited about that, right? Uh, I'm very hyped to see like us be out in the world now that the pandemic is almost over out here. Um, me, Yasmin, and Jazzy are going to be in the same city by August in Baltimore. So we're really excited to do some outreach trio work together and get to meet some people in the Baltimore and Maryland area and start doing that type of work in education and playing. So I'm really excited to see us start getting active and moving forward. But so far, I'm just happy with the community we have here. Anyone? Uh, Jazzy, did you want to say anything? I guess I'm on the spot now. Um, so I, for me, like this group, um, it just signified a lot because before I actually had never, well, I met one female trumpet player, like a black woman trumpet player, like a long time ago. But other than that, like I really had no idea there were this many of us and I just felt alone and kind of got used to that feeling alone. Um, and I also wasn't aware that, hey, there are other people who are having the same exact experience you're having because a lot of it was like, oh, this is in my head because you don't get to hear other people um, validating the things that you're witnessing in the, the sphere. So getting to know um, all these amazing women of color has been great like these past few months, just like building this community. Like Bree was saying, now I feel like I have people who I can talk to um, who just know what I'm going through. I love that. And speaking of community, Veronica, I see you like over there cheering on these answers. And that's that's like as far as Zoom gets as much community as you can do. Can you talk a little bit about like some of the friendships you made or some of the things you're excited about with the CBC? Yeah, um, I how I was first kind of exposed to this group, it, I, I met, it, it was crazy with the pandemic. I, I made friends during the pandemic, even though we were all at home and trying our best to be home buddies. <laughs> so um, I, I uh, had a friend through a fraternity at San Jose State hit me up and he said, hey, there's this a woman from Arizona who needs a trombone player to record a track. And I just thought at first, like, oh, I'm just going to here, here I go just spinning on another track for somebody, it's fine. You know, I didn't think like there was gonna be a community that would flourish from that um, because I understood that the pandemic was also a time for folks to really center themselves and to also like work on their personal projects. And so when I met with uh, Aaliyah Danielle Qualls who is the VP of programming with the collective, um, she she was, she's obviously another black woman <laughs> and I was, I squinted because I'm like, wait, there's not a lot of black women who play French horn. And I'm just like, who is she? And so I, I tried to get to know her a little bit, but I also didn't want to like push boundaries. So I just told her like, anytime you need me to record a track, please let me know. I just thought it was great to have like somebody without like, you know, pointing out the obvious that I'm black, she's black. Like I didn't want to be all like, just because we're black, we should be friends. But <laughs> I just thought like, oh, this is a great person to be connected with. So after doing a few projects with her, she actually was like, hey, there is a collective starting up with a lot of uh, Black and POC and LGBTQ plus uh, folks that want to just get together and just kind of, you know, create a community. And I went, count me in, just put me in the chat. I don't know what's going on. Just, I have zero clue what's going on. Just put me in because I, relating to the stories of, um, you know, kind of what Brie was talking about, um, or, and also jazzy that 
in college when I was playing bass trombone was the first time I've ever felt, um, I guess, alone. Um, I mean, not only that I have that I'm black, but anybody who was black within the music department, it, they didn't seem to last long. And so I would see them for a couple of semesters and they would disappear or, you know, they were like a person who was just kind of seeing what the department was like and then they would disappear. And even though I tried to like reach out and like, you know, build some sort of community, it just didn't feel like that there was enough want. And, you know, everybody comes from different backgrounds. So it was either A, like they couldn't pay for school or B, like they just had something going on or B or C, like they weren't getting along with their instructors. And so um, every time I, I felt alone and then anytime I would bring up any issues that were like going on in the world, there was a little bit of erasure and invalidated, in, invalidated. Oh my gosh, I can't talk. I was invalidated for it. <laughs> and so um, I just thought like, okay, maybe I'm the one that's crazy and not, not maybe I'm getting too emotional about it. So I just didn't have anybody I could relate to um, with those things when it came to school. So um, fast forwarding to now, um, you know, seeing the collective and meeting Yasmin and meeting, um, you know, Jazzy and Brie and uh, Vivi, don't worry, I'll, I'll shout you out in just a second. <laughs> um, but like seeing other black women, especially for me was like something that I felt like, oh my gosh, am I able to be myself with this group? And can I actually like poke in and be like, be like my authentic self because yeah I was black but I also play video games a lot and I also listen to alternative rock music on the side and sometimes like you know with the culture clash of like you know R&B and hip-hop like it, I may not align up so yeah I'm I'm ranting a little bit and I'll close myself up but like I the moment I was able to kind of express myself um I felt a sense of like embrace from this group especially with the first couple of meetings and then we all got to know each other by um telling our stories and expressing the, the struggles and challenges that we face in school. And I just felt finally like, wow, I'm not alone. I'm not crazy. I'm also glad to see that there is other black players that are really passionate about staying with the art because we've been with it so long. Like we've, we all started in elementary school or middle school with this. So it would be really awful if we just stopped just because of the things that society has like pressured us to feel like we weren't in the right path. And so I'm just really glad to be here um, and, and you know, just be here to like have a sense of belonging and be myself and make people laugh and not feel like what I'm saying is wrong. So um, I, I, I guess that's from a community aspect. I'm really glad that we're able to grow together like that. I feel like everyone else has gone, so now I have to. Um, but I definitely would like to echo like all the sentiments of earlier. Um, especially, I think one of my favorite parts about this collective is that I think that resilience in and of itself is like a form of resistance. And for all of us, like being women of color, existing in predominantly white institutions, being classical musicians, like we have a lot of resilience, right? Resilience. We've made it this far, and that like being here, being able to like claim your own successes is a really strong form of, um, you know, standing up against the system, but also it is exhausting. And I think that having this coalition makes it not only um, easier on like myself to be able to validate my own feelings and experiences, but I think it helps everyone, right? And I mean, I know for me personally, um, because I go to a conservatory style school, um, like I'm the only non-white person in the entire brass department next year. And that's like a very heavy toll for a person to take on top of all the other things that we have to achieve as musicians, especially with classical music. It's so, um, not like, I mean, it is strenuous, but things are so harsh, you know, like there's just so many cutoffs. There's really picky conductor that will call you out just because of how you look and that kind of stress, um, has always taken a really big toll on me throughout my undergrad and now into grad school, but being able to hear that other people experience the same things is really powerful and has definitely helped me to stay motivated, especially through the pandemic when it's really hard to connect with others. You know, being able to find this shared experience has been a really, really powerful thing for me personally. Thank you all of you for these just really open and honest answers. Um, so we recently celebrated Juneteenth, which is fantastic. And um, in the spirit of education, I wanna just say like, please feel free to not answer if you're not comfortable, but um, you know, in the idea of just doing what we can to educate people and promote allyship um, and, and just making sure that we are 
educating society and coming together. Is there anything that you want people to know um, that can be other women of color, that could be maybe more specifically um, people who are not of color, people who maybe just don't get it yet and are trying to, or just, just some like general advice or things that you really wish people would stop saying, you'd stop hearing, you, you want some more understanding. I, I feel like this is really a space where we can be open and honest and do what we can to help lift each other up. And um, just, there's a lot going on in the world right now. There's a lot of um, attempts to dismiss education and to um, sort of, you know, wash away history in a very particular way. And we won't go down that path, but I think that when we have spaces like this, it can be really impactful to, to speak up in ways. So if any of you have anything you'd like to say or advice you'd like to give for people, um, you know, looking to be allies and, and move forward in, in this, you know, um, striving for equity and diversity inclusion and all those buzzwords we hear, but they really mean something, they're important. And so I wonder if any of you are comfortable talking a little bit about that. Thanks, Veronica. Um, some advice that I would love for um, educators um, who are doing their best to accommodate students and really promote intersectionality uh, with their sections, with their ensembles, is that, you know, do your best to explore past your biases. Um, it's especially with, with I have, I have um, worked with a number of um, new educators, old educators who, who are like, how do I help, you know, my Mexican students, or how do I help my black students? How do I help my Asian students, especially my Asian women uh, who are, you know, they seem shy and not able to like speak out loud, but like, you know, how do I reach out? And so I, I always, my advice is always just kind of explore past your biases and that trust that when your students are working or when you have a, a colleague who's working that they're actually actively thinking about the art they're actively thinking about ways to improve and sometimes what i've discovered is that not a lot of educators realize that that sometimes they read the face they misinterpret facial exp expressions they misinterpret you know like silence as a complacency and so i always try to like encourage them to think past that um because i know that's happened a lot and with like, you know, friends, myself, and et cetera. So that's one thing I, I always like to say is just try your best to explore past biases and also listen, like listen and, uh, you know, listen and making sure that you're really hearing what they're trying to say and not assume that it's something else. Um, so, yeah. Yasmin. Okay, sorry, it is like seriously storming out there, so. That's what it is. Um, but so if you hear rain, that's where it's coming from. It's me. Um, I think that more than anything, I would like for people to just look at how things look. I think that's the thing that or irritates me some like the most is it'll be like a Black History Month concert and there'll be no Black people on the cover or it'll be a brass anything and it'll just be only white men on the cover. And it's just one of those things where I'm like, all you have to do is ask yourself that added question of how does this look to every person that I'm trying to send this out to? Because um, there's just a lot of times where I'll see, you know, oh, we have this premiere for this piece that's written by a black woman, but they didn't contract any black women to actually do it. Um, or we have a Black Lives Matter post and it's like the blank symphony and it's like the all the members of the orchestra, but I'm like, yeah, diversity, but like there's no <laughs> people of color in there. Um, so I think really like take that extra step, read the roster. Don't just like trust that it's your friend and you know, I know that it's going to be great. Um, choosing, contracting people by way of friendship and by way of who you know is a very quick gateway into perpetuating racism because if you are white and you only talk to white people, those are going to be the people that you contract to do the job. So I would just ask myself at every single iota, hey, I took a whole picture of my horn studio. Let me, oh, there's only one, you know, there's only one person of color, there's only one minority or whatever, whatever that means to you in this picture. And because I, I think that some of it is, puts the work on our shoulders to fix an issue that's perpetuated, not by us. 
So I think some of the work that needs to be done on the other end is just literally looking at this image and saying, okay, this is a problem. I need to do something about it and putting your money and your time where your mouth is, because a lot of people say pro diversity and pro all this kind of stuff. But when we're faced with a student whose horn is not that great, we lose patience. When we're faced with a student who doesn't have the money or the time or the energy to apply to a a festival because they're really expensive um we lose patience and they don't take it seriously they don't take it seriously as seriously as somebody that has the money to do that um so you know all, all these kinds of things but really like like you know like veronica said listening and really asking yourself like what is what does this picture look like and what does this picture say who this is for if just judging by the lineup, do, would, I, would a person that is black think that this is for them? And if the answer is no, then you need to fix that problem. That's, that's pretty much. And whatever finances or time that you need to put into doing that, then you, you need to do that. Or maybe let's stop talking about diversity because it's, it's a lot of action or, or words, not a lot of action. So that's, that's my piece on that. Jazzy. Yeah, bouncing off of both um, what B said and Yasmin, there's a lot of diversity like pushes, but there's very few inclusion pushes because we, we often we get people through the door, but once they're through the door, we don't really try to take care of them the same way. Um, like for me, like, yeah, I've made it as a black tuba player, but still every gig I show up to, it's, oh, you really play that instrument? And I'm like, why am I walking around with the thing? Um, so we need to just kind of normalize that other people can play these instruments and just try to like lift people up um, within these spaces, just make everybody, everyone known so that that's not a question that's usually asked. Like that shouldn't be a question that's ever asked to anybody, but we need to try to find ways in order to just make everyone feel included um, beyond just getting them there. Um, piggybacking off of what Jazzy was talking about, uh, I was going to say kind of like the same thing. The biggest thing I'm very frustrated with when I go out to perform in white spaces is the lack of respect for me as a trumpet player in comparison to like my male colleagues, like to the point where like even if I am playing principal, they won't address me. They will talk to my male colleagues and like have them relay messages to me or like only talk to the male colleague as if they were playing principal and then like just have me like do things by proxy and it's just like super microaggressive like other people in the room like have no idea what's happening but it's like eating me up inside and making me feel so unwanted in the space that I'm working so hard to be a part of for some reason like I have to like constantly keep like going through that little like tiki tiki tack in my head of like I'm so frustrated in this space, but gosh, I love the trumpet and I won't let men kick me out of this game, you know? So I'm just saying, like, if you're gonna, like, pretend that you want to have, like, your diversity students, essentially, like, I basically feel, like, tokenized in most of the spaces I'm in. You can't, like, keep putting, like, one Black person here and one Black person there, and it's, like, no one has a community. It's not a safe space. It's not actually, like, a workable, functional space for that person. You're just using them for, like, your concert pictures at certain angles to make it look like you were diverse, you know? It's very compromising to the person, and if you claim that you're creating diverse, safe spaces, you need to also create a community for those people. Like, me and Navila, our secretary. We have that same vibe that V was talking about of you would bump into another black person, but like Navila was about two or three years older than me. So the vibe was, I never got to be in an ensemble with her like that, you know, cyclic token vibe, you know, whenever she would have left, I would have been around ready to be in her groups, but we would never, the past will never cross, you know? I can't build a community with Navila and I can't run up to her out of the blue and be like, so I noticed we're both brown. Would you like to be my friend? Like, but thank God, chromatic brass. So eventually we did become friends. And one of the first things we mentioned was, gosh, I wish we would have just done that. So, I mean, if you feel creepy about it, I would have taken the friend. <laughs> I think most of us would have taken the friend. So just do the thing if you bump into somebody. But um, yeah, I just want respect when I go places. I just want respect like the boys. That's all, just treat me like a regular trumpet player. And when I play um, above a G, don't be shocked. 
that'd be cool. Or if I can play above a mezzo forte, don't go, wow, big sound for a girl. That's rude. That's rude. I eat my breakfast. I take my vitamins. There's no need for that type of disrespect. I practice just like the rest of them. If a boy that weighs 50 pounds less than me can play loud and you're not surprised, <laughs> why are we having this argument every time I go out and do my thing? And honestly, this is why I stay in church music because at least they're ready for me there. Like it's gospel, I can do my thing. No one's ever like, oh, you're actually playing trumpet. They just like appreciate and respect me in my environment. So that's why I always like keep my <laughs> church gigs on the side so I can have one space where people actually respect me as a trumpet player like and coming up to me constantly like I told my niece in Tennessee about you <laughs> and how good of a trumpet player you are and it's like no one talks to me like that in the college of music it's just like oh you still do it thanks for showing up you <laughs> know no acknowledgement whatsoever that's all I had to say on the if I could get one wish this is what I would get <laughs> Um, I also, sorry, Brie, that was so funny. I was laughing the whole time. <laughs> um, but um, anyway, I think um, not advice, but like a firm request that I have like educationally is that I think things need to change within the higher ups, right? Like within the administration. Um, I think one of the worst experiences that I have had is when the conductor is the one to call you out for, you know, being a woman of color, well, like in front of the whole orchestra, I mean, it's mortifying. And like, when that happens, the problem obviously lies in kind of that mindset, but also that it's coming from a person in a position of power, right? And that's very belittling. And that's the kind of thing that happens where I've gotten called out before, like not called out like, oh, you know, this is, you're sounding bad or whatever, but like they'll point out something about me and that makes me on edge for the rest of the rehearsal. I can't play as well because I'm nervous. And having people in power, being able to offer more solidarity is really, really important because obviously all the things we've talked about, I think, at least in my experience, I see progress within students, right? With people our age, I see people trying to become allies and I see that and there's a lot of work to do, but the worst is, at least in my experiences with people in administration, right? Like, um, Yasmin, I know you have experienced this, but every institution I've walked through, they plaster my picture like on the wall, you know, they try to use me for branding, for media. They're like, look at this little girl. She plays the tuba. She looks so foreign and exotic. Let's snap a picture. Let's put it in the front of the building. Let's blow it up to life size. And I'm like, okay, nobody asked me if you could do that which administrative figure made that decision and thought it would be okay? Like, did they think about how it would make me feel? And I just, there needs to be some kind of like, I don't know, better communication or training or something for people, especially in like music school administration, because that is like a very toxic environment if you're a woman of color. And those people have a lot of power in the decisions that are made. Um, and so experiences like that, I think, can be avoided if, um, you know, like faculty members, if administrators are able to like have those conversations with musicians. So yeah, I just, I really wish to happen because it's happened at every school I've been at, at most professional gigs I've been at, things like that just, and it's oftentimes out of the control of the musician because you know, it's the person who gave you the gig who's doing it. And it's like, what, what do you do about that at that point? You know, like, so, yeah. I think you're all stuck carrying around like NDAs before we go to gigs. <laughs> no pitch. Yeah, give me that royalty check, please, for my image. I will um, add $200 to my gig fee if any photos are taken of me without my permission from now on. I love it. That should be a thing. Let's make it happen. <laughs> Thank you all so much. These are just such phenomenal answers and I really appreciate your vulnerability. Let's go on a, a slightly lighter note here. And, and can you tell me like, what do you consider to be some of the most fun or the biggest accomplishments in your career? Like something, this is your time, like your brag square, your little square, you can say anything you want and we just want to like celebrate you. <laughs> Jazzy. Last, um, I don't know, was that? Last August, late last August, um, I launched a project called Revolution, the next generation of tuba music, um, which is an EP that I commissioned three black composers to write three pieces in black music styles. 
um, for solo tuba and whatever sort of like music they wanted to do. And um, right now that's coming to fruition. I'm in the process of starting to record some of the pieces live at the end of the summer. And I'm doing a little demos of them with like electronic backing tracks like right now. Um, but that project was definitely like a highlight because I just want younger students of color to know that they can be represented. They can see their music represented because not everybody listens to classical music. I mean, we've been barred because of classical music. So I just want to increase representation with this project and think it can. I love it. Veronica? Um, I uh, consider myself much so a supporter um, or a supporting role when it comes to uh, big accomplishments. Um, so one of the big bands that I'm in called Seven Street Big Band, uh, I was a composer um, and I also played bass, trom with, bass trombone with them and we released an album about three, three years ago uh, called All Cinderella Lane where we just, you know, add in a bunch of funk, jazz, things that are just kind of authentic with, um, you know, the writers from San Jose. Um, and so I thought that was like a really cool thing because not, it's not every day that I get to collaborate on a big band album. Uh, it kind of made me feel like a little like snarky puppy for a second. Um, and then the last thing is, um, it's kind of on my, on my to-do list, but um, I was able to perform with Seventh Street Band on the main, on not the main stage yet, but uh, at the San Jose Jazz Festival, uh, which is a big festival in California, as well as I was able to perform in the Next Generation Festival with the Monterey Jazz Festival. Um, so it made me feel good because I was able to kind of bring or bring my accomplishments right back to home, uh, but also still continue to build with how far I've come along thus far. So that's, that's what I'm kind of proud of. <laughs> Those are huge accomplishments. Definitely not like supporting. That's those are both really exciting things. Congrats. Thank you. How about you, Brie? Anything? I am working on graduating and getting out of Florida, getting over to Baltimore. <laughs> and I'm starting up a podcast with Jazzy. It's gonna be called Harmony and Healing. It's coming out pretty soon, like within the next couple of weeks. That's so exciting. I can't wait to listen to it. And what are you doing in Baltimore, Brie? Oh, um, I'll be working kind of like with Jazzy with the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra or Kids Program as a brass teaching fellow, um, working with kids and teaching brass all over like the city. So exciting. Congrats to both of you. How about you, Vivi? I don't know. I'm not really one to humble brag. Um, I mean, I'm happy like where I am going to school and like playing tuba. I guess um Okay, if I if I had to just do one simple humble brag, it would be that um, at the end of my undergrad, I paid off my tuba with money that I won playing tuba, which if you know how much those things cost, <laughs> that was a lot of work, many, many competitions, but like some like something about like playing a competition and like beating the boys puts like fire in my veins. <laughs> I don't know, like it feels good, you know what I mean? Um, but that's definitely something like that made me feel very independent and accomplished when that, you know, was my baby was finally paid off. And it was like, you know, I, I obviously like I work through school, but it was also the competition was like a testament to like me being able to play my instrument, which was definitely like a hard thing for me to wrap my head around because like so many people had told me otherwise for a long time, but yeah. <laughs> Kudos to you. That's so, such a big accomplishment. And also like, yes, prove them wrong. <laughs> Yasmin, anything from you? Yeah. Um, okay. So um, I think my biggest accomplishment as far as like something to put on a resume that's like, you know, marketable um, was I think doing the, was that the 57th, 49th? I don't know. There's too many numbers these days, but the somewhere between 43rd and 58th um, annual Grammy awards, like three or four years ago. Um, I did that with um, Chance the Rapper, which was really cool. Um, it was a cool experience to just like be in the Staples Center and down there and be like, oh my God, it's Nick Jonas. He's shorter in person. You know what I mean? Um, so that was, <laughs> he's really short. Um, so that was cool. Sorry, Nick. Um, but I think 
I think more immediately, um, definitely just teaching and just getting to know some of these really awesome kids in Baltimore. Um, there's a lot of really beautiful people out here and a lot of people that I feel like get discounted and counted out, especially children. So really just working with that community has been really, really rewarding and them really welcoming me because it's not, it's not a community that they will welcome you to unless you wanna be there, you know? Um, so that, and then I guess the last thing would be, you know, this, <laughs> the collective. I think that is like just the proudest thing ever um, just cause I mean, this is amazing and just building this thing that I would have really really loved at like, you know, 14, 15 um, and having, you know, the International Horn Symposium coming up this year and, you know, going from being a volunteer six years ago to now being like a sponsored exhibitor, which is like a huge deal for me personally and to play for all of my teachers, which is great. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Definitely a huge deal. Congratulations. Um, so you you did some name dropping there and, and in all of what you're doing, we hear a lot of collaboration. So I was wondering um, what musicians, regardless of instrument, would you want to collaborate with CBC if you could choose anyone? Beyonce, 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 Beyonce. If she wants to redo that whole homecoming thing, come back another time, I'm available. We, we're out here. Okay, that's all. I see a lot of nods. Is this just universal votes for Beyonce? Yes. <laughs> yeah, we are a hive affiliated um, ensemble. It's it's unofficial, but she knows. I love it. I, love it. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, also um, I'd like to collaborate with. Um, I think. Let me think. I'd like to collaborate with like Michael Abels, the guy that writes the music for uh, that wrote the music for us. Um, I think he writes really awesome music. Um, I'd also like to collaborate with, um, well, we're doing some of this with Marie Douglas, who is a composer um, and Valerie Coleman. That's another person I'd really love to collaborate with and like write a piece for us. Um, yeah. I love it. So obviously we've got Beyonce, but aside from Beyonce, are there any women of color that have inspired you growing up? At, they can be musicians, non-musicians. Um, I guess I'll jump right in. Uh, yeah, so some women of color who inspired me uh, just kind of growing up. Uh, I when I saw Esperanza Spalding live, and that was life changing. Just hearing how silky her her voice is, and just like how well she was able to sing and play bass at the same time. Now. Singing and playing trombone is a whole different thing. I mean, you could do you could do the multiphonic thing, whatever. But <laughs> but uh, no, like when I when I saw her perform, it was just it was just life changing. Um, especially when it's like you're 16 and you just finished a big tour with a with an honor band that you're on, and then like you know while just watching this live and it's like late at night, like you're just like wow, that's so cool. So. That was that was something that was really awesome uh, for me to experience seeing a, a, a black woman uh, you know perform like that on the main stage at the Monterey Jazz Festival. Um, obviously my mom. <laughs> Can't forget the mom. Um, and I think also um, so I have a pretty uh, extensive background in ethnic studies. That's what I got my minor in. Um, so I have a lot of role models that are um, activists of the past. So like Angela Davis is a really big one in both like her thought and also her action. Um, and Yuri Kochiyama is also a really important uh, figure for me in terms of like her activism. She was a Japanese American um, activist who worked with the Black Panther Party and Malcolm X. And she was very, very prominent in the civil rights movement. I think those like very strong women of history who like stood up for your civil rights and like fought against a very, very oppressive system in their time. Like that's something that I like hold on to very dearly because like they paved the road for us, you know, like wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. Back in time, if we're like going back in time too, I'd like to add in uh, Nina Simone, but if I have to do someone current again, I'd say Alicia Keys, cause she's also pretty solid. 
Awesome. Any anyone else? I can say that. Um, she's a uh, like. This is random because this is on Twitter, but I like Twitter. Um, so I love No Name. This like rapper named No Name. I think that she's really amazing, and she completely left sort of the mainstream music industry to basically start this free bookstore that like enlightens like, you know, just free black thought and even not within that, even everything else from, you know, prison, the prison system and all these things that I think other people really need to know. And she put her money where her mouth is and it's free too, which is something that I really like. Um, and it's very much into mutual aid and all these other sort of things that um, help out people. So I really like her and anybody that sort of takes the stand against a thing that they could have easily fallen prey to, but they decided to go a different path. I just think that's really awesome. So yeah, <laughs> if she sees this, call me, yeah. <laughs> awesome, well, we're gonna move fast for these last couple because I wanna get two more questions in for you if I can. Um, so if you could just give like your elevator pitch of advice to younger women of color brass players today, what would it be? Let's start with Jazzy. Just keep going. You're doing great. Like wherever you are, the fact that you exist is like defying the odds. So just keep going. Thank you, Vivi. The more people who tell you you can't, the more likely you are gonna be able to do that thing. Veronica? I have a variation. Uh, keep going, don't stop. You're doing amazing and and you'll find and you'll find your community trust. Yasmin. I would probably say you're enough. There's no change that needs to happen to you fundamentally. There's no skin tone that you could have. There's no hair texture you could have. You are as awesome as you are and as you ever need to be. So don't ever want to be anything else, even if that other thing looks easier. It's still, you're, you're enough. That's what I would say. And Brie. The best thing you can be is you. The only better thing you can be is better than yourself yesterday. Okay, everyone, I'll be right back. I'm gonna go print these on t-shirts and wear them everywhere I go. <laughs> no, seriously. But this is so great. And I'm just so glad that with this time of connection and, you know, the pandemic was horrible, but some good things have really come of it. And I'm hoping that now, like, imagine if one person sees this, this, these clips of you saying this, it could really change someone's life. And that's what's so cool about the internet and social media, as terrible as it is sometimes, stuff like this is so great. So um, thank you all so much for being amazing today. I have one last question. We do this on all of our IWBC interviews. It's a tough one, but I think it's good. Um, and so the question is, money aside, COVID aside, if you could do any dream project or do anything, um, what would it be? Anyone want to take a stab first? Veronica. Um, I would love to get all of Mega Rand's uh, catalog. And Mega Rand is a nerdcore artist. <laughs> So here I am with my gaming side of myself. Uh, Megaran is a nerdcore artist who's been recording forever and he has actually the largest uh, catalog in the world when it comes to hip hop. But I would love to orchestrate it where a live orchestra can, can perform his songs and he can just rap to the live music. Janelle Monae's done it, Metallica's done it. So I would love to see if I can engage myself with that one day. That's so exciting. I love these answers too, when it tells you more about a person, like it's, it, cause it's, you know, it's not just like, oh, I want to sit in my practice room and play my instrument. It's like, here's these other things that I love and I'm going to bring them together. Anyone else have an answer? Brie. Um, I think I'm living like my peak life for this reality. However, comma, if I could re-exist in 1977, I would be on tour with Earth, Wind and Fire until I died. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs>
I think Brie already said it, but for Beyonce to either redo Homecoming or update it, I don't really know. There needs to be French horns. I don't know why she left out mellophones. I mean, I know why, but um, so yeah, I would want that sort of to go on tour and for our collective to be on that. That would be really awesome to me. Um, and then the second thing is I would love for this to eventually become like a symposium or some kind of camp, some kind of meeting where everybody can kind of all come together once a year and sort of like talk to each other and play together and make recordings. So yeah, two things. Jesse. Uh, I guess I have two too, um, or two as well. Uh, so my first one would be to um, start a clinic for Black people primarily for musicians and fitness. So just so people can go and like get fit and play music, which would be amazing. Um, and then my second one is to just actually be able to do outreach concerts and stuff like that as a lucrative career um, without having to be a professor. And Vivi. This is a hard question. Um, I think it would be cool to like, just go to other people's concerts. Is that like a good way to answer? I don't know. And I mean, there's so many artists that I would want to play with. I don't know how, like how to narrow it down, but I think it would be really awesome to like do any kind of like video game stuff. Um, like Veronica, I also like gaming. So um, yeah, like the, gosh, I think they're called like the eight bit big band or something like that. Yes. Like, if I could like solo in front of them, I could do it. That'd be pretty sick. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. These are all such great answers. And it's it's been so fun getting to know you all a little bit better today. Thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you for the amazing work that you're doing in the brass community because it's really making a difference already. And it, I'm just so excited to see where this group goes and all of you individually. Um, so we will we will be sure to plug all of your socials and emails and websites and all that kind of good stuff so everyone can keep track of what you're doing. And we're so excited um, for, for what's coming next with CBC. So thank you all so much. Hi, my name is Teresa May. I am a co-founder and treasurer of the Chromatic Brass Collective. This collective is a community of women and non-binary brass musicians who are racially and ethnically underrepresented, who also happen to have the same goals. We are striving for progress, community, and visibility. In the brass world, there is a need to increase representation and inclusion of diverse players. There is a need for opportunities to showcase underrepresented composers. There is a need for new material in the brass community that mirrors the world we live in. There is a need for an ensemble that blurs genre boundaries while celebrating historically underrepresented women and non-binary people. There is a need for the chromatic brass. With the help of your donation, we will be able to fulfill our first year goals towards progress, inclusion, community, and visibility. We understand that progress takes a village, and we thank you so much for being a part of our village. There is no dollar amount too small, and we thank you for your financial contributions towards progress.